Hey guys, Jamie here with Milk Allergy Mom. I am with my allergist immunologist, Dr. Siri from Midwest Allergy Sinus Asthma in Central Illinois. Yay! Yay, I got it! Today we're gonna do a quick um, overview of allergy testing because we really do get this question at Milk Allergy Mom. You know, there's some of us who've been around for 13 years and we think we, we got the basics down, but there are always kiddos and people, adults now even, being diagnosed with allergies or they have a reaction and they need to go figure things out. And we still, there's still people out there who really need to back it down to Allergy 101 and they have questions about allergy testing. And you know, do I need, so anyway, we're not gonna talk about do you need to have allergy testing because that's another topic for another day when a child has a reaction or something and maybe the pediatrician's trying to help them out or whatever, we always do say if you've had a allergic reaction, get to an allergist. They know how to do it. My pediatrician did not know how to treat our food allergies very well in the beginning. So we found you and so there's different ways once you get to an allergist for them to help you out and figure out what what you're dealing with. So what are the different kinds of allergy tests that can be done? Sure, so basically allergy testing as it applies to food is um, there's skin testing, there's blood testing, and then finally to see if, uh, you know, if there's a question in mind or whether the skin or blood tests are you know, um, uh, discordant or concordant, then we do a uh, oral food challenge and that typically involves actually uh, ingesting the food product uh, that's um, a question. So um, shall we talk about skin testing first? Yeah, let's define what skin testing is. I mean, sometimes there's some confusion, you know, sometimes it happens on backs or arms and are we really getting yeah. the food in our skin? Like, what is that exactly? What's, how does the skin right. test work? So the skin testing is now called a prick test. It used to be called a scratch test because back in the day, um, yes, we were cruel back in the day. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there was a metal prong and then it, it used to be that the skin would be scraped or scratched uh, with the allergen at the end. And so, um, you know, with the advent of plastic devices uh, that are disposable, so now they are single use, they're no longer metal, it's no longer a scratch, it is a prick test. And so each of the um, disposable devices are typically pricks. Um, and uh, their one-time use at the end of each, uh, they sit in wells of allergens. It's so that the end of each prick is a different allergen. That could be asparagus, it could be milk, it could be peanut. Um, and then the extracts come from um, FDA approved manufacturers um, in the United States. There are several of them that make them. Um, and then the skin uh, basically gets uh, a little bit of a tiny little poke um, with the allergen. Mm -hmm. And um, what's wonderful about skin is that it's uh, you know, a huge organ in our body. And then the mast cells and things like that, they recognize um, things that you're allergic to. So what's sitting on those skin cells is um, something called um, IgE, immune globulin E. Um, IgE. <laughs> you have so, a water bottle that, water says, bottle it. that says it. Nerd alert. <laughs> Sorry. No, oh. you and I together. So, okay, so. Um, uh, I like to say E for evil, but IgE has um, <gasps> interesting purposes in our body and it helps us, you know, it's part of the immune system. It's supposed to help with parasites, things like that. But in our over complex, you know, um, uh, upcharge immune uh, world, uh, because of all sorts of reasons, um, it has learned to recognize things that we should not be allergic to, such as ragweed and cat and food in this case. Um, and so um, you, if you're an allergic person, that IgE has a home. It typically sits um, where the mast cells sit as well, or basophils in the blood. But that's typically um, the skin, the gut, um, the urinary tract, things that, uh, the respiratory tract, things that line surfaces where you interact with the outside world. And so those are probably the most places that IgE exists. And so in which case, um, then um, if you have specific IgE, you've made your immune system make specific IgE to whatever it is that you're allergic to, ragweed, then when we tickle your skin, then it releases all sorts of chemicals. Mm. Um, and the chemicals include things like histamine, mm -hmm. um, leukotrienes, prostaglandins, those kind of things. And so we see the histamine response because it makes the skin engorged and red and itchy. Yeah. And so when we skin test you with milk or peanut, then within 15 to 30 minutes, we'll see a lump that comes up that looks like a mosquito bite. Yes. And so then that's how we visually Or it know. can look the size of a quarter mosquito bite. It could be a big I have bite. a lot of experience in these skin <laughs> tests, Dr. Siri. Yes. So yes, yeah. you get the big redness and that, right. the swollenness and that will, uh, sometimes we get asked about the different names for the what you're measuring. You want to go over that real quick? Yeah, so it's typically measured in what we call a wheel, which is a lumpy part. So okay. these actually really do look like hives, and that's how we describe hives, is a wheel and a flare. So the wheel is the, the lumpy part that comes okay. above the skin, and then um, sometimes it looks round, and sometimes it looks weird, like an amoeba. So those are typically more <laughs> aggressive reactions. Those are typically gotcha. four plus not um, on a usual scale. Yeah. And so um, I only laugh because we've had those things. <laughs> many of those things. Yeah. Yours look like big amoeba sometimes. Yes. Yeah. 
Um, and then the flare is the redness around it. And of course, typically it is itchy as well, which is, you know, the, mm -hmm. actually, I don't think the poking is as much um, problematic as, you know, if you have aggressive reactions, right. the itching I feel is worse. Um, and so, uh, so the wheel and the flare, and so we often measure the wheel size. Some people also measure a flare size. Like in our clinic, we measure both the wheel and the flare. Um, so, you know, you can have um, different um, results depending on the technique. So maybe a less skilled allergy nurse might poke the skin and then you can have something that looks like a wheel. It's a little red, but there's not much of a flare. And sometimes there might look like some bleeding. That's probably, well, probably over poking. And so the technique is really dependent on the operator. And this is interesting as from running a community of 14,000 <laughs> allergy families a lot of times they'll show you know some results and want people to help but you're saying that really um whether they measure the different things they're measuring and things like that can vary so when we're trying to compare notes sometimes that's why we don't understand what we're seeing <laughs> from somebody else so it can vary by doctors so the allergy community has tried to standardize that by having everybody measure you know wheel and flare but you know usually the grading scale is zero to four zero being no reaction one plus being maybe there's something there two plus maybe it's mild but three and four pluses are two typically you have an allergic reaction mm -hmm. with four plus being the biggest reaction. Mm -hmm. Some people still do it on a zero, one to five scale or zero, zero to five scale. Most allergists are doing it on a zero to four scale. But since you know it can vary, maybe the reads varies, maybe the operator varies, we're supposed to measure it compared to controls. So then we try to measure. But so if, if there's a wheel, but there's not much of redness around, it's not itchy, it's probably not a, a positive reaction. Yeah. And so sometimes it's hard. And then, you know, depending on who you are, whether your allergist allows you to take photos, sometimes visual images are helpful too. Right, right. Um, so those things are all helpful. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Let's go on to blood real quick. Sure. You got a quick synopsis on blood for us? Blood testing. Yes. Um, just before we transition to that, the thing about skin testing, there's also something called intradermal testing, which is more like a TB test we put it in the skin. Um, nobody really does that to foods. It's not considered safe because, you know, obviously, if you're allergic to a food sticking in the skin is probably not a good idea. Yeah, so awful. <laughs> Don't do that to me. So we do that for indoor outdoor allergens. Uh, some allergists still do that. Um, uh, oh. So we don't really do that to foods. Okay, uh, good okay, to know. Just so you know. Um, and then as far as uh, the blood testing, mm -hmm. so uh, there's um, standard, what we call Imidacap IgE testing. It, the old way is the old procedure, which used to be called a RAS test, and a lot of doctors like to call it that. Mm. Um, but really the modern procedure for most labs, you can still run a RAS test, but for most labs, it's actually um, uh, not uh, a uh, RAS test. It's basically um, an Imidacap test. And so when you see it come back, typically it's what we call Imidacap. It's just a different procedure technique, but it's uh, a better test, uh, a little bit more specific, those kind of things. And so uh, the the difference between the two is that here with a blood test, we're trying to measure the level of IgE that's floating around, free floating in the blood. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't represent what's in the tissues, in the skin, in the lungs, in the lining. And so the problem with that is that you can get false negatives because maybe some young children just don't make a lot of IgE that spills over into blood. Um, some people who just, you know, all of their IgE is bound, they won't have a lot in blood. It can vary from day to day. Mm -hmm. um, so some people are making a lot of IgE one day and not a lot of IgE the other day. And then in people who have um, very high IgE, particularly seen in those with atopic dermatitis or eczema, they can have IgE in the thousands. We're talking like 10,000, 5,000, 50,000. Mm -hmm. um, and so in those cases, um, there's so much IgE, you get white noise is what I call it. Mm -hmm. And so it looks like you're allergic to everything on the planet. So they basically do a blood test and they're like, you're allergic to everything. But so you have to know what their total IgE as well is mm. as well, so you can have a comparison. And so how that test is done is that there are wells with things that you're specifically allergic to. You know, they'll put you know the patient's serum on top of the wells, um, and then uh, they'll have something um, that is an enzyme that binds to the IgE that's sitting on top of the wells. The patient's IgE that's sitting on top of the wells binds to it, and then um, that highlights it. But then they'll wash the rest of the IgE off. And so sometimes if you have like so much IgE all of it doesn't get washed off. And so that's why you get like white noise with like low levels of like IgE bound to every food. So you can get false negatives and false positives in both the skin test and the blood mm -hmm. test. Mm -hmm. That, um, that, so from a mom perspective and how we talk about testing a lot, one thing that we get confused about when we compare notes in places like our community is maybe one allergist will, you'll come in and they'll skin test and another allergist will do just blood test and one will do both. and. And we think, well, my allergist isn't as good as that allergist because we didn't do it that way. And so how can that vary between the, the two different things that an allergist will do? You won't always do both. You, I know there's times where you did both with us and then we'd come in and you'd just do a skin test on my son with milk allergy and then you wouldn't do a blood test. And I just, I just, okay, that's what we're doing this time. But you probably had a reason why. Right. 
um, you choose what test you're going to do. And for us, we were doing them every year. So some people go and do them maybe every six months. I know when he was young, we did every six months because we thought you might change this might change really fast. And then as we saw this was becoming longer term, we came in once a year. Honestly, there was one year where I wasn't in the mood to be told we were still doing with this. So we skipped a year. And so we did that by choice. But what would be the overall picture of if an allergist is going to do skin or blood or both? And right. a lot of it is driven by clinical decision making, mm -hmm. which means that, you know, um, one clinical decision making to patient safety. Mm -hmm. So um, first of all, if you come in and you're telling me my son just ate peanut butter and he had anaphylaxis and then he right. did it a second time and had anaphylaxis. What's the point of doing skin test? You know, so you want to validate that it is peanut butter and not the bread or something else. You know, so most likely, you know, all probability, and so everything is uh, driven by what we call pretest probability. Like before uh -huh. we do the test, what's the probability that this person, child, adult, you know, human being is going to have a reaction? To this? Because you're looking at our history, yes. you're looking at reactions that have happened. So history taking and clinical suspicion drives everything. And so if that child is basically more likely allergic to milk than not, then you don't really need to do a skin test because if you can do a blood test that you know. Is, um, has a, no chance of having anaphylactic mm -hmm. reaction. Sure, you can faint on doing a blood test, but there's no chance of an uh, anaphylactic reaction doing a blood test. Um, barring latex and those kind of things. I'm an allergist, <laughs> so I have to say those things. But in any case, um, and so why, why not do a blood test first? And if the blood test comes up, then you have your answer, especially if it's a brisk blood test. Mm -hmm. So if you told me you, I had anaphylaxis to peanut and your blood test was barely positive, I'm thinking, yeah, you know, the results don't jive. And so um, if the blood test is really positive, we have our answer, we don't need to do a skin test. If the blood test is really not convincing, then a skin test would be indicated in that case because we still don't know for sure. Right. Um, and so let's just say we know we've established that your child has a milk allergy and now we're following it along. So not only then does it become pretest probability and decision making, but now it leans more towards medical decision making. Can I do something about it? Does this person still need to carry the EpiPen? Mm -hmm. Are they outgrowing it? Is there a possibility I can move on to something like a food challenge? Mm -hmm. And so that's why the doctors often will do repeated skin testing or blood testing afterwards. So many doctors will do a blood test first, see where you're at, and then if it looks like the blood test is a zero, that's really exciting. And then we may chase it then with a skin mm -hmm. test first, then to make sure that, because because just because the blood test is at zero, like I said, there's false right. negatives. You really need a, a skin test thereafter, and if that one's zero, then we're ready to move on. Sometimes to you challenge. need some confirmation with both of them, and they can be done in different orders, because I know sometimes right. you would have us do a blood before we came in for an appointment so we could discuss it. Yeah. Sometimes we would come in for a skin, and just do skin. Sometimes we would do skin, and then you would want to follow up with the blood. Right. So it can really be any order. There's no right or wrong. Mm -hmm. Your allergist is crappy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because they're. Sorry, that was a terrible way to say that. No, I, um, I think if you're not understanding why something's being done, I think that you know simply ask, talk to your allergist yes. and say, hey, you know what? What do you think are the benefits and risks? And they'll explain it to you. Right. Um, but largely, you know, if you know you have an allergy to something and you're about ready to physically orally challenge it, it is a good idea to have both because you want to have determinations about. Because I said there's false positive, false negatives to both, and so we've seen where kids will react to fresh milk but not react to the extract which has been modified and then they will react to um they won't react to um, either the extract or the blood test but they'll react to the can you talk stuff. about that really really quick because i just learned this so when you do skin testing there's like lab uh solutions that you can use or you can actually do it with milk is that what you're talking about an extract versus actually taking the food and doing it yeah, so uh, we um, actually probably are going to talk about it in another video where we talk about oral allergy syndrome. Okay. But, so, for example, some people will react only to the fresh, unmodified food groups and mm -hmm. not actually not to an extract or cooked food. Um, and so that largely has come from um, those concepts where, you know, the fresh, unmodified food maybe has some specific proteins that pa patients are allergic to that aren't existing in um, the cooked format or the extract. Okay, when um, we do skin is, testing, what is the milk? I want to know about milk. Milk and egg and peanut, what is that? Is that like a solution that's, that you have on hand from yes. labs so, or something? So all of the extracts that are used in the United States of America are FDA approved, and there are okay. several manufacturers of them. Okay. Um, yeah, it's it's milk um, uh, or it's egg, uh, but they are a modified extract that comes out of a, a bottle that's been quality tested um, by um, these manufacturing okay, companies gotcha, that gotcha. are all FDA approved okay. extracts. I was getting, because with our OIT and food challenges and stuff, sometimes we've done here like touching it on the skin before we go forward and so I'm confusing that with skin testing but that's just like a precursor for us to do an oral challenge or something here you know what I mean 
Yes. Does that so, make sense? so regular traditional skin testing um, that you might do in usual allergy offices so are typically going to be the extracts. Scratch, that are, extract. Uh -huh. Okay. Gotcha. Scratch testing. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that leads into a third one, and we talk about blood and we talk about skin a lot. It's something we've been doing for 13 years with our kiddo. The third one, food challenges, mm -hmm. where they come in and consume the food under very good supervision and so tell us a little bit about that and that's where I was saying like sometimes they start with it to your lip or your your skin or something to be really careful before you move on into yeah. the food challenge that's what I was talking about so the food challenges is a diagnostic procedure as well um, this is not food desensitization this is basically to see is your child still allergic to the food or not a test it's a test right and so typically you know could you start with a food challenge and not do testing uh, I'm sorry and not do skin testing or blood testing sure but you know most of us are kind of conservative and we probably don't want to just say go for it let's do a food challenge um, so most of us would you know gather the information and think about the probability that the child's gonna react before we actually introduce it live and have an even higher risk of an anaphylactic reaction so you know um, and there are some you know measures that are actually be, have have been written you know if a blood test is uh, over a certain amount in a certain age group you know in those kids you know 95% of them will fail the food challenge. Mm. If a uh, skin test has a certain you know, amount or size, for example, in peanut allergies and other allergies, if, it, if it's beyond a certain size, 95% of those kids have basically are gonna gotcha. fail the food so challenge. So there are some thresholds out there. Definitely standardized are. thresholds. There have been published. And so if your child is meeting one of those and you know has a large skin test or a large blood test, you know most likely your allergist is gonna look at it and say, most likely your child's gonna fail this food challenge, so let's get the food challenge this year and maybe we'll wait and see if your child outgrows it or some other strategy such as OIT. But in any case, um, if it's low enough, there's a, a question in mind, um, uh, then you might move on to food challenge, in which case the food challenge process is a diagnostic test. And so typically you will challenge to a food product in which um, you're interested in eating or you wanna see if they've outgrown that food. Um, and so going back to the blood testing, there is something called component result diagnostics. And so you may hear it as a blood test or component testing. Yeah, and so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that exists to some uh, food products that are available. And in those cases, um, it again gives the same probability of which proteins is your child allergic to specifically for milk, for peanut, for eggs. Um, then it might help to determine in the future either passing a food challenge or which foods might be able to be introduced. Or in the case of milk and egg, whether or not some of those foods that are cooked or baked, as I said, have been modified, might be tolerated as opposed to foods that um, are fresh and uncooked. And that's and so, in blood testing? That's in blood testing. In blood testing, uh -huh. they can break down the proteins that make up milk and egg, peanut. Right, and so they'll test certain proteins that many people are allergic to. Right. You know, you can't test every single protein that exists, but the majority of people may be allergic to certain of those certain proteins. Certain parts of it, so that it can open up more, oppor more eating opportunities if you are not allergic to other parts of yeah. that food allergen, like milk or egg or peanut. Yes. Yeah. That's and cool. in the case of, for example, peanut, you know, uh, we know that, you know, certain peanut proteins such as ERA H2 are associated highly, if you have it and you're positive and you're allergic to that protein of peanut, there's more risk of anaphylaxis than the other proteins, oh, for example. Oh, gotcha, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. And, the, and with milk, there's one you can do baked goods better than the other protein. So yeah, yeah it can open up a lot of freedom. And mm -hmm. I've seen that whole thing change over 13 years as an allergy mom, where we used to just have the, you're allergic to milk, don't eat any milk. And now with challenges and desensitizing now um, on the right, that we're able to do desensitizing, that it is good to have that specific information to our child so that it may offer more opportunities for us to eat and right. safely be safe. So it's, it's getting more specific and it's helping families. That's Definitely. awesome, yeah. So very cool. Mm -hmm. So that was skin testing, blood testing, and oral food challenges. Correct. Mm -hmm. And I would say the skin and blood is something we're all pretty familiar with, unless we have some new parents coming in, which we always do. And um, then the challenges can be kind of challenging. So that, that's one that you really want to make sure everything is, all the ducks are in a row and that you're in a good situation to do those challenges. Um, I think nobody wants to think that you know you're subjecting a child to something that potentially is dangerous. Right, right. So having all the information before you go into right. it is the best option. And most of the time, most sports certified allergists will challenge your child because they think that your child probably is not allergic to it, and we want to right. move forward. Right. Um, have there been requests of like you know my child has never been uh, has never eaten um, peanut or has never drank milk ever since they were little because they were diagnosed because they had bad eczema. We removed the food and then now right. things are clear and we don't know. Um, in those cases, there might be um, basically a reason to challenge. 
challenge, but again, I you know I think that it's probably best to get a, a skin test and a blood test before right. that happens. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, because you still want to know and be as safe as possible. Right. You're right because many of us, I'm learning this too, many of us are avoiding foods that we tested allergic to in skin and blood, and we've avoided them for ten years, and we really have no idea what will happen if we do eat them because we've been going on this diagnostic test for a decade. And right. so this is where challenges can be really helpful to families in the right situation with the right doctors um, to open up opportunities. We see that happen a lot with our community. And so it's really exciting that people are being able to add in new things that they were just strictly avoiding was just the thing to do for yeah. a long time. So um, I think maybe yeah. it'd be good for us to do a video on how to prepare for a food challenge. There you go. Would that be good? That would be a very good video. And if you have any other videos that you would like to see us do, leave a comment and let us know. Let us know your questions. We let you guys drive what we talk about. And so we would love to hear your thoughts, your questions, and maybe we can do a video on that in the future. One last thing that can be confusing, I want to say real quick, then we'll say goodbye, is that just because a doctor will do a food challenge does not mean we get confused sometimes because desensitization is something that is also big and happening in the community world. Just because they will oral food challenge you, some won't oral food challenge, right? It, it's all the determination on what the doctor's comfortable right. with. Right, so okay. Some doctors don't do food some challenges. Some doctors don't do food mm -hmm. challenges. Some doctors will do a food challenge, but they will not do desensitization past the food challenge if you failed it or if you had some kind of threshold but you didn't completely pass, they will not take you beyond that to desensitize you. Some will do the food challenge as a precursor to then doing OIT with you if you did not pass it with flying colors, which is what you're doing with us with milk. We right. did an oral challenge and made it to a certain point and then you said, let's work on this on a regular basis with a, with a specific protocol to you and I can take you further past where you pass this challenge. So some will not do an oral challenge, some will only do the challenge and nothing more. Some will do the challenge and go beyond with you with desensitizing the food. All right, that sound good? That sounds good. All right, you guys, we're gonna head out and uh, again, leave any questions that you have um, for Dr. Siri. We can do videos in the future for you. And I already left you a link. We have some videos that we've already done in the past that are at the milkallergymom.com blog and you can check all those out and binge on us all day. We can be like Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, we'll talk to you later and we'll come back and look at the questions too um, and, and answer some of those as well. So we'll talk to you soon. Snacks. We do need snacks. snacks. We have coffee. I can't. <laughs> See you later. Mm -hmm.